So, okay. So Stanford, how'd you get into autonomous vehicles? I had the great fortune uh, and great honor to join Stanford's DARPA Urban Challenge team in uh, 2006. There, This was a third in the sequence of the DARPA challenges. There were two grand challenges prior to that. And then in 2007, they held the DARPA Urban Challenge. So, you know, I was doing my postdoc I had. I joined the team and uh, worked on motion planning uh, for, you know, that, that competition. So, okay, so for people who might not know, I know from from a certain, <laughs> autonomous vehicles is a funny world. In a certain circle of people, everybody knows everything. And in a certain circle, uh, nobody knows anything in, in terms of general public. So it's interesting, it's, it's a good question what to talk about, but I do think that the Urban Challenge is worth revisiting it's a fun little challenge, one that insp- first of all, like sparked so much, so many incredible minds to focus on a, one of the hardest problems of our time in artificial intelligence. So that's, that's a success from a perspective of a single little challenge. But can you talk about like, what did the challenge involve? So were there pedestrians? Were there other cars? What was the goal? Uh, who was on the team? How long did it take? Any fun, fun sort of specs? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So the way the, the, the challenge was constructed, and just a little bit of backgrounding, as I mentioned, this was the third uh, competition in that series. The first two uh, were the grand challenge, called the grand challenge. The goal there was to just drive in a completely static environment. You, know, you had to drive in a desert. Uh, so that was very successful. So then DARPA followed with what they called the urban challenge, where the goal was to have, you know, build vehicles that could operate in more dynamic environments and, you know, share them with other vehicles. There were no pedestrians uh, there, but what DARPA did is they took over an abandoned Air Force base. uh, And it was kind of like a little fake city uh, that they built out there. And they had a bunch of uh, robots, uh, you know, cars uh, that were autonomous uh, in there all at the same time, uh, mixed in with other vehicles driven by professional uh, drivers. And each car uh, had a mission. And right? so there's a crude uh, map that they received uh, at the beginning, and they had a mission, you know, go you know, here and then there and over here. Um, and they kind of all were sharing this environment at the same time. They had interact- to interact with each other. They had to interact with the human drivers. So it's this very first, very rudimentary um, version of uh, a self-driving car that, you know, could operate on and on you know, in, a, in an environment, you know, shared with other dynamic actors that, as you said, you know, really you know, many ways, you know, kickstarted this whole industry. Okay, so who was on the team and how'd you do? I forget. <laughs> uh, we came in second. Uh, perhaps that was my contribution to the team. I think the Stanford team <laughs> came in first in the DARPA challenge, uh, but then I joined the team and, you know- we You were the with, one with the bug I, in the I, code. I, I mean, do you have sort of memories of some particularly challenging things or, you know, one of the cool things, it's not a, you know, this isn't a product, this isn't the thing that, uh, you know, it, there's, you have a little bit more freedom to experiment so you can take risks and there's, uh, so you can make mistakes. Uh, so is there interesting mistakes? Is there interesting challenges that stand out to you or some like taught you uh, a, a good technical lesson or a good philosophical lesson from that time? Yeah, uh, you know, definitely, definitely a very memorable time. Not really a challenge, but like a, one of the, most vivid memories that I have from the time. And I think that was actually one of the days that you know, really got me hooked uh, on this whole field was uh, the first time I got to run my software on the car. And uh, I was working on a part of our planning algorithm uh, that had to navigate in parking lots. So it was you know, something that you know, called free space uh, motion planning. So the very first version of that, uh, was, you know, we tried on the car. It was on Stanford's campus uh, in the middle of the night. And you know, had this little you know, course constructed with cones uh, in the middle of a parking lot. So we we're there at like 3 a.m. You know, by the time we got the code to you know, uh, uh, you know, compile and turn over, uh, and you know, it drove. I could actually did something quite reasonable, and you know, it was of course very buggy at the time and had all kinds of problems, but it was pretty darn magical. I remember going back and you know, 
you know, later at night trying to fall asleep and just, you know, being unable to fall asleep for, you know, the rest of the night, uh, just my mind was blown. <laughs> just like, and you know, that, that, that's what I've been, you know, doing ever since for you know, more than a decade. Uh, in terms of challenges and, uh, you know, so interesting memories. Like on the day of the competition, uh, it was you know, pretty nerve wracking. Uh, I remember you know, standing there with Mike Montemarillo, who was uh, the software lead and wrote most of the code. I think I did one little part of the planner. Mike, you know, incredibly did you know, pretty much the rest of it uh, with, with, with you know, a bunch of other incredible people. But I remember standing on the day of the competition, uh, you know, watching the car, you know, with Mike and you know, cars are uh, completely empty, right? They're all there lined up in the beginning of the race. And then, you know, DARPA sends them, you know, uh, on their mission one by one. So then leave and like, you just, you know, they had these sirens, well, 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 they all had their different silence, silence, right? Each siren had its own personality, if you will. So, you know, off they go and you don't see them. You just kind of, and then every once in a while, they, you know, come a little bit closer to where uh, the audience is and you can kind of hear, you know, the sound of your car and, you know, it seems to be moving along so that, you know, it gives you hope. And then, you know, it goes away and you can't hear it for too long. You start getting anxious, right? So it's a little bit like, you know, sending your kids to college and like, you know, kind of you invested in them. You hope you, 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 you build it properly, but like it's, it's still uh, anxiety inducing. Uh, so that was uh, an incredibly uh, fun uh, few days. In terms of you know bugs, as you mentioned, you know one that, that was my bug that caused us the loss of the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, is there still uh, a debate that you know, I occasionally have with people on the CMU team? CMU came first. <laughs> I, sh I should mention uh, that CMU uh, haven't heard of them, but yeah, uh, it's some you know <laughs> little, small little school. school it's 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 yeah, it's a really a glitch that you know they happen to succeed at something robotics related. Very scenic though. So you know, <laughs> most people go there for the scenery. Um, yeah. Right. It's a beautiful campus. <laughs> I unlike, unlike, unlike Stanford. So uh, for, for people, yeah, yeah, that's true. Unlike Stanford. For people who don't know, CMU is one of the great robotics and sort of artificial intelligence universities in the world. CMU, Carnegie Mellon University. Okay, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> good, good PSA. So in the part that I contributed to, which was navigating parking lots and the way, you know, that part of the mission worked is, yeah, you in a parking lot, you would get from DARPA an outline of the map. You basically get this you know, giant polygon that defined the perimeter of the parking lot. Uh, and there would be an entrance and you know, so maybe you know, multiple entrances or access to it. And then you would get a goal uh, within that open space, uh, X, Y, you know, heading where the car had to park. It had no information about the obstacles, so obstacles that the car might encounter there. So it had to navigate uh, kind of you know, completely free space uh, from the entrance to the parking lot into that parking space. And then uh, once it you know, parked there, it had to uh, exit the parking lot. And, you know, while of course encountering and reasoning about all the obstacles that it encounters in real time. So, uh, our interpretation, or at least my interpretation of the rules was that you had to reverse out of the parking spot. And that's what our cars did, even if there's no optical in front. That's not what CMU's car did. And it just kind of drove right through. So there's still a debate. And of course, you know, if you stop and then reverse out and go out the different way, that costs you some time, right? So there's still a debate whether, you know, it was my poor implementation that cost us extra time or whether it was, you know, CMU uh, violating an important rule of the competition. And, you know, I have my own uh, uh, opinion here. In terms of other bugs, and like, uh, I, I have to apologize to Mike Montemarilla uh, you know, for sharing this on air, <laughs> but it is actually uh, one of the more memorable ones. Uh, and it's something that's kind of become a bit of a, a metaphor and a label in the industry uh, since then, I think, you know, at least in some circles, it's called the victory circle or victory lap. Um, and uh, it, our cars did that. So in one of the missions in the urban challenge, in one of the courses, uh, there was this big oval right by the start and finish of the race. So the ARPA had a lot of the missions would finish kind of in that same location. Uh, and it was pretty cool because you, you could see the cars come by, you know, kind of finish that part leg of the trip, that leg of the mission, and then you know, go on and you know, finish the rest of it. Uh, and other vehicles would, you know, come hit 
their waypoint uh, and you know exit the oval and uh, off they would go. Yeah. Our car in the hand would hit the checkpoint and then it would do an extra lap around the oval and only then you know uh, leave and go on its merry way. So over the course of you know the full day, it accumulated uh, uh, some extra time. And the problem was that we had a bug where it wouldn't you know start reasoning about the next waypoint and plan a route to get to that next point until it hit a previous one. And in that particular case, by the time you hit the that that one, it was too late for us to consider the next one and kind of make a lane change. So that every time it would do like an extra lap. So and it you know, <laughs> known as the the Stanford victory lap. <laughs> the victory lap. Oh, that's de- there's. I feel like there's something philosophically profound in there somehow. But uh, I mean, ultimately, everybody is a winner in that kind of competition, and it it led to sort of famously to the creation of um, Google self driving car project, and now Waymo. 